Right. It's my pleasure to introduce Opa Ravid to you. Ravid? Ravid. Ravid. That was not the substance tea that I'm uh, trying to eat every day. Um, uh, Opa was already known to you from our little experiment on the first day, but I met um, Opa um, actually um, almost a year ago now, like, um, and we had several really uh, nice discussions in the IMC and ongoing work about playfulness and presence um, in acting, but also transfer to other situations um, of work and life. Um, Ufa is an actor, um, a theatre artist himself, has worked as an artist, uh, as an actor, as a director, as a teacher and a researcher in the field uh, quite across the world, has been the, um, the pedagogical and artistic leader of uh, one of the leading actor schools in Israel and is now here in August uh, teaching since um, two years and also um, actually um, being a father and also that has informed um, his, uh, his work uh, on the topic a lot and I'm really happy to hear your talk today. Thank you. So, hi. Um, so we are talking, as you see, there's no screen. And uh, since uh, we're talking from the point of view of theater, and I, uh, theater is many things. It's not one thing, and there are many types of theater. But if you boil it down to the essence of theater, um, it is really about human encounter. That is what defines theater from any other art, right? So you can say, oh, there are parallels in cinema. But yeah. What's the big difference? What makes theater unique? It's the human encounter between the people who come to watch and the person who actually creates the art right there and then in the same shared space and time. So I kind of created myself a stage here so I can be closer to you and really have an encounter, not only with the people here, but hiding. Uh, so you can't hide. Um, um, and uh, I'd like first to um, ask you all a question, a just show of hands. Who of you? Which one of you went to the theater in the past once? Wow, impressive. Past six months? Past year? Who haven't been in the theater in the past year? Okay. How about the movies? Who have been to the movie in the past month? Past three months? Past year? Who haven't been to the movies in the past year? Much less. Okay. So, uh, how, how do you perceive theater? Do you, do you like it? Do you enjoy it? Is it something you do for fun? Yeah? Okay. And what do you enjoy there? What do you enjoy there? <laughs> the, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I, I enjoy actually this this frequency. It's not. I'm not totally immersed like in movies because there's a distance. It was, I mean, there's a, there's something happening on the stage, but I also I cannot totally forget that and cannot totally go on the stage like in my, that I that I have in movies, but everything yeah. stuck around here or something. And I enjoy it. Right. So 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 there is reality. Yes. It's not only for only fiction. Yeah. yeah. What else? That I actually can talk with the actors afterwards. Okay. If, if they stay, they don't rush home to I'll be at the exit, making ah. sure they don't. <laughs> yes. It, it happens only that way of one single time. Yeah. 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 Hopefully. If, if, if they actually let themselves kind of go on the main pile. Yeah, just the experience, the creativity of a story you probably know. Uh, sometimes, uh, yeah. There are a lot of acts we actually go watching several times, mm -hmm. and uh, it's always in the new version. That's that's quite it's a thing. Okay, that's yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. When I go to the theater, I always uh, think that whatever the actors do is there on the stage. They are not like only frames of movies that uh, in the cinema they have to put it together. So it's. I, I found that they always have to do more work in a piece of theater uh, than in a movie. Because you see, like, <laughs> like a lot of, No, yeah. I mean, in, in the one hour that you see, the actors have to do everything yeah. here. Yeah. It's not doing one year with many uh, yeah. Yeah. parts. So, so I mean, there are many other things. A century experience. Huh? I, I go for the century. Sensory experience, yeah. So, so what, what we're talking about is something that really, I mean, what I just mentioned, right? It's the, the encounter. Most of what 
you said is, is related to the fact that something is happening that is alive here. It's not a screen. It's not something that is close-ended, right? It's, it, it cannot change. It actually can change. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this, about um, uh, how playfulness relates to the question of presence, uh, which I call uh, I prefer the word presentness, and I will explain shortly why, um, which is one of the essences of, of, of live performance, not only theater, but any live performance. And, I, um, and, and I'd like to kind of create this connection because it is crucial, and I think um, my job as an actor trainer, which is one of my biggest, uh, 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 most, uh, most of my time in the last few years, is dedicated to teaching acting, um, is to train people to be present and playful. And I would say them together because they relate to one another. Because playfulness is always with or towards. Uh, so f for me, in my eyes, for, for, for my, I would say, needs, uh, it is always in, an intentional uh, uh, attitude towards something. It's not, it's, I'm not just playful, period. So it is always transitive in a way. And, and it is always connected to the type of presentness that I have here and now with or to some, some, someone or something. <coughs> right? And I, I, I just want to kind of note the distinction between almost everything that we saw um, in the last few days and, and what I'm talking about because I'm not talking about the, I'm talking about the human first and foremost. Right? So even when I'm connected to an object, the question is not the object. The object is not playful, ever. No object is playful. Only humans can be playful. I mean, there are animals, yeah, but, but, but I'm talking about what we're concerned with now for, for the sake of, uh, uh, of the question, of the main question. So an object is not playful. And, and my question is, how do I make people playful rather than how do I make objects make people playful, right? And that's what I do in my, in my, in my job. I help people become self-motivatingly playful. So almost, and this is of course a metaphor, almost like, okay, let's turn the switch of playfulness on. And because this is people's jobs, it's their job to be playful. Okay? An actor's job is, okay, now go on stage and be, play be playful. Even if it's a tragedy, by the way, it's still playful. It has to be, because otherwise, and I will talk about this kind of uh, uh, problem of, of, of presence uh, in that sense that what happens when you're present in a tragic form, right? Where is playfulness there? We'll talk about it. So, uh, uh, I'll tell you uh, uh, one thing. Most theater that I see, for me, and it's because probably my, my standards are pretty high, most of it is kind of boring. Mm. I was about to say so. And, 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 <laughs> and, and, and I have to say that 90% of theater people that I know think that theater is boring. Deadly boring. And the reason why it's boring is because you can see the people on stage knowing exactly what's going to happen. And they're not even pretending to, um, to, to show you that it's not the, the case. But where is the fun in seeing someone show you a story where you know everything, every movie in advance, right? I mean, the whole point is not, I mean, the story I can just read. Just take the story and read it. Mostly I go see the play that I already know the story before. Why am I there? I'm there to reveal something, moment by moment, right, through the actor. I want the actor to reveal something to me. But if the actor already anticipates, I anticipate with him. Right? So um, the challenge here is how do we create what is in the jargon of performance studies called twice behaved behavior. Right? So a repeated behavior, a reenactment of something that is spontaneous. Right? So this is the, the, the kind of the biggest challenge of the actor. I need to do something I've learned by heart, the lines, I've practiced these moves for hundreds of times, so it's like I can do them in my sleep. But continuous. Right? So and it's a paradox. Right, and I'm going to, uh, um, towards the end, I will use the, the idea of paradoxes as kind of a leading thought towards um, thinking about playfulness and presentness 
um, and how actually paradoxes help us to think about this and, and, and how playfulness is, uh, in a way, the mechanism to go through paradox and stay alive. Okay, so, um, so we're talking about uh, uh, my work. And my work uh, is based on, as, as Kat said, art, teaching, and research. And this mix has always been kind of, um, uh, um, um, I never know where I am exactly, because I research my, my, my teaching, and I teach my art, and, I, and it's all kind of influencing one another, although it's very different practices. Uh, that kind of required me to um, mix some different um, uh, methodologies. And I'm just going to tell you that what they are because it's important for just to understand the background and also touch upon a little bit of theory, so we have the background there. Um, and we're going to play. So this morning was already in the program. Um, you are going to be my partners. Um, and uh, I'm not going to force you, but I hope you will join. Um, and, and thank you, by the way, Angus and Liam, for warming us up into a state of play, because it's fun. And it's important, because playfulness requires warming up. It's not, it's not magically just happening. It's a process. Um, so so methodologi methodologically, um, theoretically, I'm rooted in performance studies, uh, of course, acting theory, uh, and specifically, um, um, framing that within Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology and grounded theory uh, emanating from common and neuroscience. So I'm not a scientist, but I'm a uh, grounded theory theoretical, and I will just give you a few uh, tastes uh, later on. Um, another place uh, that I, my research is coming from is practice-based research, which means using a lot of methodology from the social sciences mainly, uh, qualitative methodology, not quantitative methodology, which means participatory observation, in-depth interviews, uh, and so forth. And what is the least probably uh, um, academic is practice as research. Practice as research um, approaches the practice as a potentially place of knowledge in itself. Right? So we're talking about embodied knowledge, knowledge that is not translatable or transportable <coughs> into a text, academic text. So you can actually describe and kind of allude to what's happening in practice, but the actual knowledge is something that is, you, you need to practice it to gain that knowledge, okay? and also to transmit it. So we're talking about embodied knowledge and about, about trying to transmit this embodied knowledge from someone who supposedly knows, or supposedly knows the process, to someone who supposedly hasn't been through that process and needs to just find out what happens. Okay, that's, that's basically training. Any kind of embodied training. It's not about me teaching you something, it's about me taking you through a process so you learn it by yourself. Okay? Um, I, I, nobody can teach playfulness. Nobody can teach presentness. But I can tell you what you might be doing to make you, if you were engaged in an activity, to make you that. And then you can tell me it didn't work. Oh, no, let's try something else. Or let's try it again in different conditions, and so forth. So you will learn it by yourself. And it's very similar to, to the kind of learning that Amos was talking about with the, with the Lego and the open-ended lie, right? Lie. Um, so um, I want to ask you now uh, uh, to vote, OK? Because there are two options now. We can either kind of, I can stop talking for a second, for a few minutes, and we can play two games, or we can kind of get over with the theoretical part and play later. So who's for, it's going to be a vocal vote. So who's for, uh, say yay, if you're now for just getting over with the theory now. Yay! Okay, who's, say yay if you're getting to play now. Yay! It's a draw, it's kind of like an in. Let's do it again. Okay, so, so if you want to change your mind, you're welcome to. Okay, who is for theory now? Yay! Play now? Yay! Right, we're shy. <laughs> we're going to play anyway. It's just a question of when. Okay, so actually, the reason I'm doing this is not because I care what you think, it's because I want you to be engaged. <laughs> Seriously, this is, this is part of the warm up that I'm kind of taking you through. And this is important, and I'm reflecting on this. 
so that you know uh, it doesn't really matter. We can play now. We can do the theory now because we're going to do both. But I wrote you, um, uh, you know, also the show of hands. You, we are sitting here all day long, kind of disengaged with our body from our bodies, right? And you cannot play this way. Play is a physical thing. It's not a mental thing. It's an embodied, psychophysical, right? Everything is psychophysical in our processes of living. But when we are kind of sitting all day in this academic, which is important, right? And, and so we become bodiless heads. <laughs> yes, and, and, and for our purposes, we really need the body to be involved. So now your voice, your lungs, just worked a little bit. <laughs> and because it's also it kind of fun, we also kind of shouted. So it also has some kind of intention, which is always helpful not to do something that is purely physical with no intention behind it. Right? So when I'm talking about physical work in my field, it's not about the gym, where I just, oh, one, two, three, four, five, and I'm, my intention is somewhere else completely. My attention is somewhere else completely. I'm talking about um, a certain attention that goes into that physical world. OK, so uh, I'll just decide, since there is a draw here, um, and get over with the theory. It's, it's quick and, and easy, not painful, I promise. So, um, so I'm going to read some of it from the page, just so I don't forget, but some of it I'm going to talk. Um, and this is um, just so we have kind of the same footings here together. So first of all, uh, definitions. Yes, definition. Presentness. What do I call presentness? So uh, presence is a big word. It has many meanings, and a lot of the times, People talk about presence and, oh, charisma, aura, glow. Look at this person. He's got this certain je ne sais quoi, right? Um, and, and this kind of, of mythical, mystical thing, I don't care about. Why? Because as a practitioner, if it's something that I have nothing to do with, then what have I got to do with it, right? You can research it, but I can't really train anyone in that. I can't change that. It is fixed according to people who believe in that. Either you have it, or you don't have it. So, why deal with it? Right? What I'm interested in is the moment of mutual presentness. This moment in which we are together now, meeting, sharing, and having a certain encounter in which we create the experience together. There is no, uh, you know, your experience is completely connected to my experience in a way, and we are creating our mutual experience here in the space between us. Yes, and when I shift, your experience shifts, your spatial experience shifts, right? And if I go that close to Ben, he's, he's having a kind of a more intense experience than anyone else, right? <laughs> so, 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 so our, my presentness is now kind of intense for him. And, and, and so forth. So, so this is the kind of uh, question that I have when I'm talking about presentness. It's how do I influence the encounter to create something that for an actor is really important, to heighten that moment of encounter, to that, the moment of presence, or presentness, as I like to call it, and to make it more meaningful, not necessarily in the cognitive way, that's important, but that's already probably in the text, in the play, in the concept, in the visual, but in the sensory way, in the way we perceive the world right here and now, and how that, of course, combines with the contents of, of, of what I'm seeing and with the semiotic aspect. So we're talking about that phenomenon, that's presentness. And the way that we train in presentness is by doing all kinds of games, plays. We play because one of the things that they helps us do is connect, right? And presentness is about connecting. It's about connecting to other people. It's also about connecting to the space and to things, right? So uh, acting is not only about this. It's also about doing something on stage. Acting is about actions, right? <laughs> It's about connecting to other things that are a bit more abstract, like ideas that are not here in theater. They're always in the space between us. So, to 
be or not to be? That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the steel trouble by opposing and them. Right? So I, I'm not holding the idea. I'm putting it here and we're sharing it in space. So I'm presenting <coughs> in terms of present. I'm making it present, this idea, here and now. It is not my private thought. The minute I spill it out. And it cannot stay that. Okay? So, um, we're talking about a very, very, very important uh, uh, aspect of acting, which I think can translate, and in, 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 in the next few minutes I'm going to talk about presence, but I think that many times you, you kind of swim very well in the theory of play, you can replace presentness with playfulness and it will work just the same. So, um, um, presentness is, is, is this, this kind of perceptual and active entwinement of an actor with the environment, live and inanimate, and also abstract, right? Whatever is here now in this space and time that we're sharing. And once we develop this responsiveness, it underlies everything we do. Any action, any activity, it gets a sense of a bit more. It's a bit more here. It's a bit more now than our daily um, uh, activity. And that's what we want to get when we are talking about theater performance. Mm -hmm. Now, um, a bit of background about the theory of presence in performance studies because it's not a new um, idea. And presence have occupied um, uh, theoreticians and practitioners for centuries. But specifically since the mid uh, 20th century, there's been a, this idea of pure essential presence of the self that an actor needs to expose on stage and kind of share. So something that I'm holding within that is in me, that is me. Um, and this uh, idea has been criticized heavily, especially since the mid 70s, early 80s, uh, by uh, uh, theoreticians, uh, theoreticians in, in the field of performance studies. I mean, taking um, um, Derridian uh, the construction and, and post-structuralist theories and, and saying, okay, what is this essential self? I mean, is it there? What is this thing? It's, it's this kind of essentialist idea that, that doesn't really bring us anywhere. Um, and instead, they started talking about absence. So instead of presence, they're talking about, okay, lack. And, and, and started defining the place of theater for absence. And I'll give you an example of a quote by Herbert Blau, who's a very well-known practitioner and theoretician, who says, when we speak of stage presence in acting, we must also speak of its absence the dimensionality of time through the actor. The fact that he who is performing, I could say she, but uh, he said he, right? it's before politically correct gender um, equality. Uh, the fact that he who is performing can die there in front of your eyes. And he's in fact doing so, end quote. So he's kind of in this morbid uh, uh, quote, he's saying, look, I'm dying right now. I mean, the clock the is ticking in my absence. Here, I'm going to go off stage, and you're not going to see me ever again. So absence is much more present than my present, right? In a way, it's much more eternal. Uh, what I would say to that, and, and um, if you know uh, uh, Jorge Luis Borges' uh, uh, stories, there's one very famous story called The Immortal, where there's a tribe of immortals, and this guy is going to look for the fountain of youth, and he finds them, and he finds a tribe of strange creatures, humanoids, but creatures, who engage in repetition, daily repetition of strange, meaningless rituals because they lost all meaning, because they're never going to die. So the clock is not ticking, nothing, there is no end. Okay, and when there is no end, both in the sense of end, but also in the sense of goal, then nothing has a meaning. And I would say that presentness is most apparent when we know that the end is near. That's when we want to get more of, this, of the moment. We want to seize it, right? So by the end of this, of my time, and I don't know what time it is, I'm kind of bubbling here, but uh, time is running, right? I will try to get, catch more and say more things. So, oh, I forgot to say this, and this is really important, right? And that would make me more present because I would try to catch more of you and get more between us in the space. So actually, mortality and the fact that time is ticking 
is one of the promoters of printedness, and I would say also um, uh, just uh, um, I'm going to kind of skip some of these things. Um, just to, to talk about Derrida's idea of presence, and he's talking about presence as being related to the repetitious nature of life, right? So we create habits and repeat, repeat, repeat. We walk on the same road to work, we take the same bus, we eat the same, uh, in the same way, and these habits are kind of the essence of our being. And he says that this goes against the mere idea of anything special about presence. And I would say the opposite, and I will talk about repetition um, there are actually a lot, I mean, theater is repetition, right? Rehearsal is literally repetition. In, in French, the word for rehearsal is repetition. Um, uh, and and uh, theater is all about repeating something and making it live again, and making it count again, and making it different, although it's exactly the same. <laughs> okay? And that is the essence of life. Of, the, of our presence in the moment of life. Not the completely new out of the blue, but the completely new out of the known, out of the regular, out of the thing that I'm used to doing. Suddenly I find I've always used this fork in this way, but now it feels, oh, I can understand it differently. Right? I've tasted this dish so many times, but suddenly the taste, I can differentiate between it's the same meal. I've eaten this omelette every day, right? But still, it tastes different. So that is the essence of presence in my in my uh, formulation. Um, uh, so I just want to give you some some ideas of how people in my field kind of uh, came to terms with presence or presentness, as I call it. Um, and, and just a few short quotes. So. Um, John Erickson says, it's a kind of saturation of feeling, of sensibility, a condensation of experience that, in the right circumstances, it's from the person or performer. So he is um, uh, specifically also uh, situating it in specific circumstances, and the, the, the environment has a lot to do. It's not only me, it's me in situation. Right? Um, Susan Yeager uh, has a list including being in the moment, having an on-performance, spontaneity, flow, grace, vulnerability, risk-taking, sharp awareness of self and others. Um, Eugenio Barba, who is actually working here in Hosobo, and is a very famous theater practitioner and, and, and um, theorist, uh, he refers to the dilated body. So he is, in, in this metaphor, kind of saying, okay, my body extends out to the space around me, and I am uh, engage in it in a way that it is, I am a part of it. It is not, it does not end here, right? So I am now touching you all of you because I am there, right? I am sitting right next to you, I'm right in front of you, and that dilated body is a different kind of presence. Uh, I am in this kind of responsive space where the distance between us is, is, is um, uh, also a part of us. Right, so if you know the open epistemology, it really uh, correlates with his idea of, of the thickness of experience, right? Only extended. Um, uh, Lorna Marshall talks about a rich inner landscape <coughs> coupled with physical ease and readiness. So she's talking about physical ease, not to be confused with the kind of uh, uh, floppy relaxation of no muscle tone at all. So ease, but ready, right? So there's something about um, uh, um, in athletes and and uh, um, uh, martial artists, you see that a lot of the times. Not people like Van Damme, right? And you see in the movies that whenever there's danger, it's like, <laughs> right? And everything is flexed, and he cannot move, right? Because all his muscles are like, whoosh. But so this is the opposite of what happens when you're actually engaged in something like that. You actually need to relax. Say, I'm ready. Right? Be open. Let your muscles be ready to actually engage in a flexible way, not in a kind of, I'm not a stone, nothing can touch me. But I can also not respond to anything. Right? So this is the opposite of presence, being this kind of, oh, what are you? Right? This fine down. Um, uh, and, and I will stop at this. So, uh, so, 
So we're talking about heightened presentness, which is what we're kind of trying to, 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 to find, to find a way into. Yes? So and the here-ness of this moment and the now-ness of this moment become pronounced when presentness is heightened. Yes? So it's become memorable. It becomes memorable to my perception, not only to my mind. Right? So it's not an idea that, oh, I remember this idea. It's an experience. And um, um, the, 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 when I was talking about the, the born experience of theater, uh, one of the most fun parts of this is that every now and then, there is that moment when the actor forgets the line or, or starts laughing in the middle of a very, very serious monologue or um, walks and suddenly something falls down um, and everybody's like, suddenly the audience is like, <gasps> right? This is, and everyone will remember that moment better than any other moment during a performance. And why is that? Because life infiltrated fiction and suddenly there is a moment of real things happening, a real encounter with the world, right? So we're suddenly seeing a human being on stage, and we're seeing the humanity of that human being. We're not seeing the professionality of that human being of saying lines and, and, and being really good at it. And, and, and but we're seeing the vulnerability, the, the, the dealing with the problem, the question of, oh, fuck, what am I going to do now, right? Which is much more interesting than to be or not to be. That is the question, because everybody knows that those lines like, and, and we like it because it kind of it's romantic and it's whatever you know. But it's no, it is it is not the the essential experience of the encounter. It's it's a different thing. So it's kind of this uh, 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 concept of of going to the museum, right? So the theater becomes a museum. I see this great piece. Um, so, so playfulness, like presentness, is for me something that is interactional, something that is intersubjective. It's between me and a thing, me and an idea, me and a world, me and a person. And um, now, now I would like to do some very short games. And the first game I'm going to start with is very simple. I'm going to um, uh, kind of point to you guys, and this is a word association game. Okay, so I'm going to say a word. And you're going to say a word back at me. It's a ping pong. Okay? And it's very simple because you just need to come up with any words, no wrong answers, right? It's just as a respond to the word I'm going to say. So, um, okay. Mouse. Speak. Speak. Talk. Blah. Blah. Stuff. Stuff. Loudspeaker. Loudspeaker. Microphone. Loud. Loud. Mouse, mouse, cat, cat, sweet, sweet. Uh, rat, rat, <laughs> cheese, cheese. <laughs> you, you, me, you, me, you. Trap, <laughs> <laughs> trap. Okay, so this is a really easy game, and uh, and you kind of I got caught you on the which is great. And now we're going to do the same game. It's going to be a ping pong game. And, but we're not going to say words. We're going to do a sound and a, and a movement. Okay? So it's going to be something like, uh, woo! And you have to get back to me with a sound and a movement. Woo! Yay! Yay! Boom! Boom! Woo! Woo! Boo! 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 Play is that it makes us 
feel silly. It makes us feel um, exposed and kind of being taken by surprise by things, and we don't always like it. So we are training in that. We kind of say, oh, I don't care. I'm just going to be silly and be taken by surprise and be fine with it. Okay? And this is kind of part of the training. And now um, Josh is going to help me and come in here. So um, we're going to do this game really quickly because uh, we don't have any time. And I was talking too much. I told you to stop me. <laughs> so um, please look to the left or to the right and find someone to be your partner, just like Josh is mine. So whoever's next to you. And please. You see, now Josh and I are going to just stand and look at each other. And so please stand and look at each other for 20 whole seconds. Look at each other. Are you ready? Are you ready? 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 Okay, 20 seconds. Go. Please quiet. And stop. Okay, so sit down the bridge with So how, how did it feel? To kind of just stand and look at each other. Weird. Weird. Why? So what happens? Okay, we're, we're now standing. And what, what, what do you expect to happen? I'm asking you guys. <laughs> Somebody laughs. Somebody laughs. Why? Because it's awkward. So laughter is kind of a cover for, what, for the real thing that's happening, okay? Because it's awkward, but awkwardness comes out of the truth that we're trying to hide, right? It's a response to the real thing. And the real thing is that it's an intimate <clears throat> encounter, okay? So we laugh or we start talking about nonsense or stuff like that to kind of relieve the tension of, we, we can, I mean, the next step is either we kill each other or we love each other, right? I mean, so, so we either kiss or kick each other out, you know, right? So, uh, and, and because we're kind of open to each other and we spend enough time there, that something is supposed to happen, okay? So now just shake hands with your partner and say, I give you permission to look at <laughs> I give you permission to look at each other. Okay? So, so you give each other permission to look at each other. So now it's much easier because you, it's a laugh. Okay? It's not just something. And now uh, we're going to play a game called Yes and. It's coming from the World of Improv. And this game is very simple. One of you is going to say something, anything that is a line. Okay? So that has to do with a fact or um, a thing. Yeah, so tell me something. The paintings in here are very nice. Yes, and I counted them. There are ten of them. Yeah, I couldn't find yes, all ten. Yes, and? Yes, and I couldn't find all ten. This is the end here. Couldn't find? I couldn't find all ten the first day I was here. Yes, and I think that's because you didn't look on the ceiling. <laughs> yes, and I think that's because I was sleepy the first day. Yes, and you should have gone to sleep earlier and not drink so much. <laughs> yes, and Danish beer is very good. <laughs> okay, so, so we're starting kind of to create a dialogue and, and tell a little story about ourselves, which doesn't have to be true, right? Uh, I mean, we can hate Danish beer, it doesn't matter. I didn't really count the patients here. Um, uh, and it could be also fictional, completely fictional. So let's engage now with this video partner. Just start, someone says something. And just respond to it without pre-conceiving anything. <laughs> right there and there. <laughs> so look at each other. <laughs> remember, remember the yes and. Did you, get, did you go somewhere crazy? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so you see how easily playful we are when we just have something to trigger and when we're not thinking too much. And that is a really important thing, not to think too much. So, thank you, Josh. Um, now, uh, now uh, I want to touch on two things. One is uh, the idea of uh, um, uh, a paradox. 
and I'm kind of jumping off uh, over some things that I'm, I don't have time to talk about. So the idea of the paradox, which I talked to you about at the beginning, that the paradox is how am I spontaneous Will I repeat things, right? And that idea um, um, of the paradox is not only related to that, it also, it's also related to the, actual, the question of how am I being a fictional character while I'm me, right? Am I me? Am I Hamlet? What do you mean? I'm really crying, but it's Hamlet crying, not me, because I don't have a reason to cry. Hamlet has a reason to cry, or to kill, or to be upset, or to love, or whatever it is that Hamlet's going through. So, but for a second, I make you believe that it's actually me. So where is this coming from? Um, how am I coming to terms with that? And a, another paradox, which I'm going to talk about, it's a, and, and it relates to all these three paradoxes are related, is the paradox of failure. In which, as I told you, the most funny moment in a performance is the moment in which I can't open the bottle. A failure happens. I lose my line. I, I, I bump into something, and everybody's like, oh, that was cool, right? And everything else was like, oh, that was OK. Yeah, interesting story. But that was cool, yes? And um, so, so the idea of failure is really paramount. And we are actually training actors to fail um, in a condition that would not break away, break apart the line of performance. And the failure can come in different ways. And I'm kind of skipping lots of stuff I'm, I'm talking about because I, I, I find this one of the most important things to talk about. So what does it mean to fail on stage? It doesn't mean that I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm actually supposed to follow the text and do exactly what the director said. Now I'm here. I turn to you. I tell you, take the bottle. Oh, if you don't take it, I will. I take the bottle because that's what the script says. I drink the water and I say, God damn it, Hamlet, I'm going to kill you. And so, and end of the scene, and everybody's happy. And then, every single moment there, I want to have the sensation that there is a risk of failure, that I won't say the line, that I won't get to this bottle, that actually there is a choice, another choice, that this time, Hamlet will actually, at the end of to be or not to be, decide to kill himself. Decide on the not to be, not on the to be. Right? Because the problem is that I know he's going to live. I know he's dying only at the end. But so what's the fun in that if I don't think he might actually kill himself every time you think about suicide? And he does in the place. Don't look, don't look. He thinks about suicide. Spoiler, right? Spoiler, right? Um, so, 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 so the idea of failing is paramount to the idea of presence. And it's also paramount to the idea of play, right? Because if there's no risk of failure, as we know, of not succeeding, of making a mistake, then this game is too easy, right? This game doesn't make, it's not fun, right? And playfulness is all about playing with, you know, on that fine line and saying, I'm going to check the boundaries. I'm going to see how far can I go, right? So um, sometimes it's, but by choice, like an actor, sometimes it's just because that's what happened when I say yes and, uh, yes and I jumped off the roof, yes and I flew like a bird, yes and how far can I go with it? I don't know, but I don't need to think about it because once I put it on the spot, actually my imagination takes over. My playfulness takes over. Okay? Once I am word about technique. So, um, the technique I think we have, yeah. We have one. So we're talking about technique. Uh, there are two types of techniques. There are more, but there are two types of technique in, in that are relevant to here. Relevant to here. A technique of accumulation and a technique of reduction. A technique of accumulation is I learn something new and I practice in it, and then I know how to do it. A technique of reduction is a technique that tells me I know how to do something, but that is obstructing me from doing something that I should be doing. And what we just did was a technique of, of reduction. We are reducing our inhibitions. We are reducing our uh, habituation of conversation. We are reducing, we are taking away, this is what um, Krutowski called the via negativa. So a negative way of, of training, of taking out things. Now, um, for Krutowski, this was kind of peeling until I get to the core presence. For me, in a more kind of um, uh, post-structuralist 
a thinking way or, or, or kind of contemporary, I would say, postmodern way or post 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 way. Um, I would say this is getting rid of habits so I remember things I already know. I just don't use them. I haven't practiced them in so long. Right? So we know the children know how to play. And why don't adults play? They haven't practiced it. Right? And this is about practice. Play is practice. Playfulness comes out of practice of play. So if I play more, I become more playful. And if I don't play enough, I lose that ability. Not that ability, but the, 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 the immediacy of that ability. And so what we're doing when we're training the actors is we're regaining contact to what I already knew once to do very well. And I hope to go back to that state of naivete, openness, not knowing, spontaneity, um, uh, um, failing without consequence, and so forth. Okay? Now I'm going to stop here for questions.